Hello. Uh, my name is Facundo Javier Gelati. I'm from Tucumán. I am a student of Information Systems Engineering in the UTN Tucumán. And the name of my talk is Introduction to Lambda Calculus using Smalltalk. So, uy, <laughs> the talk is divided into three parts. First, we'll see what is Lambda Calculus, then how does it work, and then we'll try to understand a little bit more of it uh, by building something using Smalltalk. So first, what is Lambda Calculus? Uh, Lambda Calculus was introduced by Alonso Church in the 1930s as a way of formalizing the concept of effective computability. A function is effectively computable if there exists an algorithm that can do the job of that, of that function. So Church shows, showed that any computable function, that is any algorithm or program, can be expressed in, term of, in terms of lambda calculus. In that way, lambda calculus is equivalent to Turing machines, for those of you who know the, the Turing machine model. But lambda calculus is more focused in a transformation rule than in the machine that implements those transformations. So in that sense, it is closer to software. But the, the main concept here is that we can express every program in terms of lambda calculus. So how does it work? Well, lambda calculus consists of two things, a function definition scheme and a transformation rule. So here is the syntax for defining a function. First, you have the variable binding operator that introduces a function, then the function parameter, then a dot, and the body of the function. So here we have a definition of a function that takes an argument x and then returns it. So it returns the same thing that you pass into it. The next thing is function application. So there we have f of x, that f is the function to be applied, and x is the argument to the function. So the main mechanism that lambda calculus has to evaluate a function is called beta reduction. So we'll see a, a little example here. Here we have a definition of a function, and then we evaluate it uh, passing y as an argument. So we bind the y argument to the x parameter and then replace all the occurrences of x in the body of the function by y. So in this case, the result is y. We see another example. Here we first evaluate the outer function with x. So we bind x to a and replace all the occurrences of a in the body of the function. So that leaves us with that. And then we evaluate it passing y. So we bind the argument y to the b parameter and replace all the occurrences of b in the body of the function with y. But there's no b's in the body of the function, so the result is simply x in this case. So that's lambda calculus. So we said that we can express any algorithm using lambda calculus. So how it is possible that we can express anything that is computable only with those simple rules, a single function definition scheme and if the evaluating of those functions. And for example, if I go back, it's important to note that we can only define, for example, one argument functions. We can define, we don't have a syntax to define directly a function that takes zero arguments or takes two or more arguments. So it's, it's really, really simple. And we have this and the evaluation and nothing else. So to answer this question, here is when, <laughs> where small talk comes in. So we first, we'll first start by noting that 
we can approximate the computation model of lambda calculus by forcing us in small talk to only define blocks that takes one argument, also one parameter block, blocks. So this is the same as this in small talk. So uh, we'll try to understand it by building something using small talk. So I will now switch to a small talk system where we can uh, see how, th how we can, the things that we can do using lambda calculus. Um. <coughs> Hello? It's good? Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe you point it to your... Hi. Yeah. Is it okay? Now? Yeah. Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay, we'll start by defining the, the same thing that... that We've, we've already seen that a block that takes one argument and returns it. In Smalltalk, we can evaluate that block by sending the message value. So for example, value three. And if I evaluate that, it gives me three as a result. So now we are going to, before we start implementing things, we are going to prepare the environment. So in, in this talk, we will be evaluating a lot, a lot of blocks. So we need a, sh a shortcut to uh, this value message. So because it's small talk, we can modify it. We can define like an alias uh, to evaluate a block. So we will go to the class of the block and we'll browse it. We'll define a method less than less than that takes an object and ju it just evaluate that block. So that just uh, a shortcut, an alias to the, to the value message. So instead of doing value three, we can simply do that and it give us the three. So the next thing that I want to do is to give this block a name. Something like, in this case, this block represents a function that we call the identity function. That is a function that returns the same thing that you pass into it. So I want to call it i. So I want to do something like this. Oh, <laughs> I, that. But the thing is that I'm using here something that I didn't define using lambda calculus, that is the assignment operator. So how we can do the, the thing that we, that we want to do that is bind the I variable to this block without using assignment. Because if I want to use assignment, first I want to prove that I can do assignment using the lambda calculus, and then I can use the, the normal assignment. So what we want is to be able to reference that block, for example, here to evaluate with, with two and three, with the name i. So what we can do is wrap all of this by a block, pass i as a parameter, and then evaluate that block using this value. So that effectively binds this block to the name i. That's not equi totally equivalent to assignment because, for example, we can't modify the value of i from the inside of the block, and we also cannot reference i from the body of this outer block because it's in another context. But if we respect those limitations, we can just write the assignment and don't change the value and, and so on, and it's equivalent to, to this. So um, for clarity, we will write assignments, but we are really doing that. And we can't re reassign and, and so on. So the next thing is two argument function. How can we, for example, make a function that returns the sum of two elements using only one argument function. So in small talk, you can, do, you can define a two argument block, for example, like this, that returns the sum of two values. 
But I don't have two argument blocks because I'm trying to do a lambda calculus. So how, what can we do? Well, we can wrap all of this by a block. And then we have an outer block that returns another block with the a variable bound to the parameter that we, we pass to the, to, to, the, to the outer block. So if we evaluate this block with two and then with three, the result is five. So that's called carrying. But okay, so we can we can do two argument functions almost. Well, so we are ready to start implementing uh, things. Uh, but as we implement those things, we need feedback to tell us how well are we implementing those functions. So uh, I decided that I could implement. Uh, for example, the booleans using TDD. So I've made a little tool that is here. When I press the run test button, it executes the contents of the workspace. And if there are any errors, it tells me by the red, or if everything is okay, by green. And I define two, I define two functions, two blocks that has uh, that have side effects, that is, first pass, not when I execute it, it prints a little green dot, and fail, we, when, we, when I execute it, it prints a red dot, and it colors that to red. So those functions are not, pass and fail are not strictly defined in terms of lambda calculus, but we need something to communicate to the other world, to the outer world. So. Yes, we, we, we will need at least something that has a side effect so that we can see what we are doing. Well, let's start by implementing true. So we first start by the assertion, assert true. Uh, assert true is, must be a block, so we can evaluate it, and we'll pass true. So we want this test to pass. But if I run the test, it says message not understood because we didn't define assert true and true. So I'll define true. We don't know what it is yet. And assert true. And we know that is a block. It must be a block that receives a Boolean and does something. So what we want to do is, in this case, we want the test to pass. So I can call pass here directly. So we run the test, it passes. So then I, I need that when I do a search true with false, the test needs to fail. So if I run it, it passes. So that's a problem. So I need to implement false, but here I've hard-coded the pass into the search true, so it always passes. So what can I do? Well, I have a Boolean here, so I can simply execute the boolean and true will be pass and false will be fail. So there I can pass fail and that's what we wanted. So then if I have assert true, I also will want assert false. So assert false. So if I pass it a false, I want the test to pass and if I pass it a true, I want the test to fail. So pass fail, pass fail. It fails because I didn't define a set false, so I will define it. So I get pass, fail, fail, pass. That's not what I want. So how can we uh, keep going with that? Well, we have hard coded the pass and fail in the true and false, so we can decide, we can change that, but we need it to change depending on if we execute the assert true or the assert false. So what we can do is, so the, the, the pass and the fail has to, have to be defined inside the assert true and the assert false. So the assertions must decide when I pass and when I fail. So the only thing I have here is a Boolean, so I can pass to that Boolean the pass block and the fail block in this case. If the Boolean is true, I want it to to give me the pass block, and if the Boolean is false, I want it to give me the fail block. And 
I can do the other way around here. So then I have to go to the booleans and change the implementation. So we have the, a boolean is a function that is a block that receives two things. A, a function that, the, a first thing and a second thing. So first, first thing, and I, have, I will have to define another block. And the second thing. And in the case that it's true, I want it to give me the first thing. So in the case, in, in, if we are inside the assert true, we'll, we want to pass. And if we are inside the assert false, we need to fail. So it will return the first thing that I pass into it. And with false, we need the other way. So return the second thing. So in the case of assert true, it will, it will fail. And in assert false, it will pass. So if I run the test, I have pass, fail, pass, fail. That was what I wanted. So we have assertions and we have booleans. And here we have a little bit of duplicated code because um, here we have the concept that I give a bo I have a boolean and two blocks and I want to execute the first block if the boolean is true and the second block if the boolean is false and I have the same thing here so I can extract that as um, a block so I'll call that if so we receive a boolean and then and then and then block and an else block. And then we must choose between the then and the else block. So a Boolean, a Boolean, if, if you remember, is a thing that selects between two things. If it's true, it selects the first thing. And if it's false, it selects the second thing. So a Boolean must choose between the then block and the else block. And then we execute that. So we can replace ooh, we can replace that with a call to the if block. So I pass a boolean and two blocks. And here it selects between those blocks and executes the, the one that that we want. So the test still pass, so pass, fail, pass, fail. So we have the booleans and the if and the assertions. So now I want, I, I'm not comfortable seeing the, the red bar, so I will, because I don't want to keep modifying the assertions, I will comment out the test for the asserts, um, well, to, to start working on, on, on the other things. So now we can, implement some Boolean functions. For example, we can try to implement not. So we start with the assertion, assert true or assert false. What well, was not true. So not is not defined. So I will define it. Not, it will be a block. Here, everything is a block that receives a boolean. And well, now we can simply return false, for example, and the test will pass. But we also need that to have not false to be true. So here we have a problem. So well, a boolean was a thing that, a, a block that let me select between two things. So. If the Boolean is true, it selects the first thing. And if the Boolean is false, it selects the second thing. So if the Boolean is true, I want to, to give back false. And if the Boolean is false, I want to give back true. True. So now that has passed, we have not. Then we can implement and. I, I have the or, or. Let's start with or. I have the, the test here <laughs> already written because we don't have much time. So or is not defined, or we define or. Or is a function uh, uh, that takes two arguments. So we'll call them A and B. Not very good names, but. And well, 
or of true and true must be true, true or of true and false must be true also, and or of false false must be false. So how can we implement that? Well, we receive two booleans. So if, if the first boolean is true, all the or is, is true. We don't need to evaluate the second boolean. So if the first boolean is true, we simply return true. And if the first boolean is false, the value of the or depends on the second boolean. Because if the first boolean is true, and the second boolean is also true, all the or is true. And if the second boolean is false, um, sorry, if the first boolean is false, then the value of the second boolean will determine the value of the or. So first boolean true, return true. And if the first boolean is false, then return the second boolean. So the test pass. And here we can do a, a, a little refactoring. If the first boolean is true, we'll return true. But we already know that the first boolean is true. So we can simply return A. And that also passes. So we have not or. Now we implement and. Why don't you just return B? Here? Always. Uh, no, because. No, OK. My mistake. OK. Um, so and, so we have to implement and. So and is also a function that takes two booleans. And in this case, if the first boolean is true, then we return the second boolean. And if the first boolean is false, we directly return false. And here we can do the same simplification. If the first boolean is false, we return false. But we already know that the, that the first boolean is false. So we can simply return the first boolean. And that also passes. So another thing that, so we have booleans, true and false. We have if, we have the assertions, we have not, or, and. And another thing that we can implement is a data structure. For example, a pair. So here we have the, the test. So I want to have a function pair that takes two elements and gives me back a thing that represents a pair. So I have here I define a pair with true and false, and a pair with false and true. And I want the first element of the pair of true and false to be true. This, but the second element to be false, and the other way around for the pair with false and true. So the first element will be false, must be false, and the second element must be true. So we don't have defined the pair function and the first and second function, so we'll define it. Pair will be a block that takes two things, a first and a second. And does something. We don't know yet what it does. And we have first. There is also a block that takes a pair. And second. So we can do it incrementally. Are we? Oh, well, uh, we don't have enough time to do it that way. So <laughs> uh, what we can do is uh, we need to select, we need the, that, the things, that the thing that the pair returns has the two values of the pair, because then we, we, when we pass that thing to first, we want to get the first value. And when we pass that thing to second, we want to get the second value. So whatever we return in pair must have the first and second values bound. <clears throat> but for example, if we just return the first value and then we return a pair here and a pair here, the test of the, the first function passes pass because the first function returns a pair, and the pair returns the first element. So 
that the first, the first block works, but the second block doesn't. So what we can do, we have a pair here. So, but we want to select the first element. So what we can do is pass a block that takes a first and a second, and it returns the first. And in the case of second, and in the case of second, the other way. And then we know that pair must return a function, a block that receives another block which selects which value does it want. So here I must return a block that receives a selector. And then we call a selector <coughs> with the first and the second. So when we call when we want when we call the pair it returns a block that when you pass to it a selector it invokes the selector with the first and the second element and in the case of first we call it with a selector that returns the first element and in the case of second we call it with a block that selects the second element so we have pairs um, well, do, do, uh, we don't have uh, more time to, to keep implementing things, but I think that the idea is clear. So we'll return to the presentation. <coughs> so we can, we can, with that, we can start to see how we can express computable functions using lambda calculus. So, uh, so only using those simple things, that is basically one argument blocks and the calling of those, of those blocks, we can start to define a language. So uh, a note of, on, on objects, a little done because uh, before we, we continue. If we look, if we look here to, uh, if we look into the implementation, for example, of true and false and if, we can see that we don't have any much difference between this implementation and the implementation with objects that we have in Smalltalk. So we can, for example, we can start to see that an object is really a set of partially applied functions. So for example, if I call if with true, then because if is a carried function, that is a block that takes a Boolean and then returns another block, that gives me back a block that represents the if true is, fo if true is false method of true, of the true class. Because here, for example, I assign it to if t, this is a block that takes a then block and an else block, and it always executes then block. Because the a boolean is already bound to true. So this is the same thing as the method if true is false that we have in the class true. So we have a partially applied function that it's the same thing as a method. So we, we can start to see how it's the, the how is the relationship between objects and uh, functions. So, um, for example, I, I don't have it here, but we can implement an object like a function that receives a selector and an argument, so it selects between partially applied functions that are the methods, and it calls them passing the, those arguments. So, but I don't have the, that example here. So. But we can start to think about those things. So, uh, we saw that lambda calculus is a general model of computation, and understanding it is important because it encodes, encodes the basic principles uh, of programming and, and computation, and 
by knowing it, we can start to think in an, in, in, from another point of view about uh, to, uh, to, to analyze the, the nature of, of computation. But also, uh, in, the, in this talk, we have a, a, a little introduction to lambda calculus. And in more or less 20 minutes, we have implemented booleans, assert, not, and, or, and the pair. So uh, for me, it's also really cool that, that we can do that only using one argument blocks. So it's not only important, but also interesting. So the things that we didn't cover in this talk are the implementations of list, numbers, operation with the numbers, loops, and recursion. Uh, having pairs, uh, you can already imagine how we can start to implement lists, but uh, if you have any doubts or if you're curious, you can talk to me later and I have all those things implementing in Smalltalk using only one argument blocks. So, and some resources to see more things like that. Uh, there are two talks that are very interesting, but the, the sad thing is that they, uh, these are not talks in Smalltalk. They use Ruby, but uh, we have programming with nothing uh, of Tom Stewart that uh, he implements the, the FISBUS algorithm. Uh, I don't know if, if you know it. It's a, uh, a known uh, program to, to practice, uh, only using one argument blocks. And then fun with the lambda calculus of, uh, with Corey Haynes that he, there he implements the numbers, the piano numbers that, well, using only one argument blocks. So, okay. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>